something different is coming at you in ministry. I encourage all of you men to step forward if you have the uh, if you meet the qualifications to serve as a deacon, and then we could get some new faces up there, so you wouldn't have to look at Craig, Tony, and myself. Tuck, Tuck is on his first year, I believe, first three year term, so he can come up another year. But uh, yeah, all right. So let's um, pray over this morning's tithe and offering. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your blessings upon this church and everyone that here that attends. I ask that you bless this tithe and offering this morning, and it'll be used to further uh, to glorify you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, Amen. Announcements. Here we go. Seventh annual Raymond Festival of Trees is coming up December 8th and 11th. And we need a lot of volunteers to help out. Shifts are two hours a piece or so, or you can sign up for as many as or as few as you'd like. On the 6th and the 7th, we will need a couple of people to assist with the setup. Also remember that the youth uh, will not be having youth group on that Friday. And they would remain in the bake sale counter for the festival festival of trees Friday and Saturday nights. Parents Day Out is uh, December 17th from 12 to 5 p.m. There are still a few seats for this uh, event. Attention parents, uh, 412 youth will be babysitting kids ages 2 to 10 for parents to go out Christmas shopping or like I was told to maybe go home and take a nap. Gift wrapping uh, services is also available. Crafts, foods, and a movie will be, be provided for the kids, and donations will be accepted. The children's Christmas program will be presented at both 8.30 and 11, 11 a.m. services on December 18th. And last but not least, uh, no service. This year, uh, there will be no services on Christmas morning. But please be sure to join us for Christmas Eve service for the whole family. This is a great opportunity to invite friends and family. And now, Pastor Ken. Good. Thank you, Steve. Didn't he do a great job? I'll tell you. Sometimes it can be nerve-wracking standing up here and looking at all you Lahinis. But I'm used to it. But uh, good job, Steve. You had uh, some pretty good Sunday things there. Um, how's everybody doing today? So we want to welcome for the very first time in the sanctuary today, um, Mrs. Brian Nadu. So uh, they got me. <laughs> yeah. And Brian. They got, uh, they got married yesterday, and um, some people, unfortunately, saw me, and they said, hey, how come you never wear a suit on, on Sunday in church? And so I like, I like to keep people guessing what the dress code is around here. You know, some Sundays I'm in a suit and a tie, other Sundays I'm in jeans and a flannel shirt. You know, you take your pick. And, uh, and then it's also great to see Nate Hughes back from Florida visiting with us. So He went to Florida to get away from the cold weather. And... Uh, Amen. So, uh, really interesting. This week, I met uh, a guy, and he told me his name was Jathan. And I'm like, Jathan? That's a really cool name. I've never heard that name before. And I said, well, pleased to meet you, Jathan. And he looked at me and said, seriously? That's so rude. <laughs> so, there was, uh, there was these two Eskimos, and they were fishing out in their kayak, and they started freezing. So they lit a little fire, and unsurprisingly, it burned a hole in the kayak sank, which goes to prove you can't have your kayak and heat it, too. Okay. All right. Are you ready for this? We are finishing a five-part series called Who's Holding Your Sword? And we're talking about a spiritual warfare that whether you like it or not, you're in it. Surprise. And um, we get this revelation through the scriptures, and our main scripture was John 10.10, 10, where Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal. And so he paints this picture of what Satan's all about, that he's a thief, 
And he comes to steal the word of God out of your heart because it's the word that produces in you everything that you need for successful living as a follower of Jesus. It's through the word that we get the revelation of who we are, what we've got, what the covenant is all about, and how we're engaged in a spiritual warfare from now until we leave this planet. And so he comes to steal that in order so that he can kill our faith. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He steals the word, kills our faith. And gets us into this defeated, discouraged, depressed mode where a lot of people live. And then he can destroy your position, your power, your possessions, all of these things that we get through the word of God. And so it's important that we understand that this is what's happening. And if you missed last week, you need to go back and look at last week's message. Because last week we talked about how Jesus did it all on the cross, right? When he said it was finished, he meant it was finished. Like, there's nothing we add to what he has done for us. And so we looked last week at the fact that we need to get off of this, this, this guilt complex where we were saved by faith, and now somehow we feel like we've still got to prove ourselves to be worthy of heaven, which is never going to happen. He, there, there's the proof of our worth over there, right? It's all He did it all. And so last week we looked at the fact that it, it's not about our behavior, it's about belief, and that's why it's so important that we, we don't let the enemy take the word because faith comes by hearing the word. And so if he gets the seed of the word out of our hearts, it will never be effective. It'll never produce the fruit of what we're looking for to be victorious. You know, the Bible says to those who overcome, I will grant to sit in my father's throne forever. And so here's the deal. You don't overcome unless there's something to overcome, right? Doesn't that make sense? And so... So I want to go right from that into something that might seem a little uh, uh, like a paradox or, or, or contradictory, but it's really not. So, so follow with me this morning. Peter said this, and we looked at the scripture before in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary the devil, so there's that warfare that's going on, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him firm in your faith. And I want you to look at those two words, resist him. Because when the scriptures say something like that, it is as much as a command for us as it is to say, thou shalt not murder, or thou shalt not steal, or thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Those are all like big commands that we say, oh, those are commands. But this is a command as well. This is a positive. Those are kind of negative, like don't do, don't do. But this is a do. Resist him. The fact that he says resist him means that your ability to resist him is granted. How many of you know that God would never ask you to do something that you had the inability to do? And when we talked about the fact that it's through the word of God that we get the knowledge of the person of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit comes into our lives to give us ability. That's what that word power means. He's, Jesus said, when the Spirit comes upon you, you'll receive power. And that word in the Greek, dunamis, means ability. So when he says resist him, he gives you the ability to resist him. So we have the ability to respond to this command to resist him. That's where we get the word response ability. I have the ability to respond. Now, if I have the ability to, to respond, and I choose not to respond, then that becomes irresponsible. I become irresponsible. And then things are going to happen that I don't want to happen, because he's going to steal the word, and I'm going to be defeated, and I'm always going to be discouraged, and I'm never going to know why. And so we have to take personal responsibility. Now, listen, this is why I said last week, this is really bugging me. So, so that's why I said like la last week, we looked at the fact that Jesus did it all, right? Jesus did it all. I, 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 am, I am on a free ride. I just, I, I get to go, I get to go right around the Monopoly board. I got a free ride. And it's all on him. But now there's this responsibility that if I want to go through life without getting my head stoved in by the devil all the time, then I have to take personal responsibility to resist him. You have to take responsibility. Listen, you have to take responsibility for your life. You have to take responsibility for your productivity. You have to take responsibility for your relationships. You have to take responsibility for your health. You have to take responsibility for your debt. 
You have to take responsibility for your feeling. All of those things you have to be responsible for. And we live in a society right now, in a culture right now, that people don't want to be responsible. As a matter of fact, you see a lot of like the younger generation, like, I don't do adulting. Well, guess what? You've got to, right? I mean, we've got to grow up. This isn't Peter Pan, uh, you know, uh, live forever type thing. This is you've got to take responsibility. I love the one where you've got to take responsibility for your debt. Don't sit there with a $1,000 smartphone in your hand, $3,000 worth of tats on your arm, a $50 haircut, and expect somebody to pay for your student debt loan, right? It's like, no, you signed a loan. You were responsible to sign for the loan. You're responsible to pay it off. So, so we got to take responsibility. Stop pushing off responsibility. Stop blaming other people. You are where you are right now by the choices you've made. You will be next year where you will be by the choices you're making now. So start taking responsibility to be where you want to be. Because, you know, stop going backwards. Stop, stop going. Because usually we want to go backwards to find something or someone to blame. Stop making excuses. Listen, it's like this guy, the, the, there was this, uh, this lieutenant, and this lieutenant in the army, he gave nine uh, GIs a 24-hour pass. At 6 o'clock in the morning, he says, I'm giving you a 24-hour pass. Go and have fun. Report back here tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. The first guy comes staggering in at 7 o'clock. And he's like, where in the world were you? He said, sir, I'm so sorry. I had a date. I lost track of time, and I missed the bus back to base. I got a taxi cab. The taxi broke down. I found a farmer, and I bought a horse off of him. I started riding the horse back to base. The horse dropped dead in the middle of the road, and I had to hike the last 10 miles to get back in here. He says, get out of my sight. In the next two hours, seven more come in. All the same story. Was on a date, missed the bus, uh, got a cab. Cab broke down, got a horse from a farmer. Horse dropped dead, and I had to hike home. The last guy comes staggering in at 11 o'clock in the morning. And the guy's lost his mind by now. And he goes, and where in the world were you? And he goes, you're not going to believe this, sir. I was on a date. Lost track of time. I missed the bus. I got a taxi. And he's like, oh, don't even tell me. The taxi broke down. He said, no, sir, it didn't break down. It's just that there were so many dead horses in the road, we couldn't get here. <laughs> you got to stop making those excuses. Listen, successful people never make excuses. Successful people don't make excuses. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Tim. When Tim was 11 years old, his dad died suddenly. He had five brothers and one sister. And for some reason, that set him into a life of rage and anger. Out of control. Mad at the world. Mad at himself. Mad at God. Mad at his dad. Just mad at everything. At a young age, Tim started getting involved in drugs. He became a drug addict. And then he started selling drugs. And he became a big-time drug dealer. Tim actually ended up getting arrested and going to jail. And in jail, he had a reckoning of truth where he stopped blaming everybody, took responsibility for his own life, started dealing with the anger in his heart, started reading books and going to school. And then he started flourishing to where he started a talent show in the jail. And it became really, really fun. He started emceeing it. And he found that as he was emceeing the talent show, they had a knack for humor. And that he was pretty funny. And when he got out of jail, he actually got a job at a talent agency. And people started hearing you know, rumors about this guy. And they started offering him jobs, all the way up to jobs with Disney. And he turned them all down because he was waiting for something that would suit him. And he finally landed a TV show, his own TV show, about a handy repairman, Tim Allen, Home Improvements. Right? Successful people stop blaming everything and everyone around them, and they take responsibility. And this is what these two words, resist him, means to us. It means take responsibility for what's going on in your life. Yes, there is an adversary. Yes, it's not always your fault. There's an enemy that just wants to harangue you and harass you, but you need to take responsibility. You don't make progress until you stop making excuses. Boy, let me say that again. You'll never make progress until you stop making excuses. That's so important for us to understand that. Resist him. 
Fight the good fight of faith. Push back, endure, and persevere. A while ago, I preached a message on prayer. And, and remember, it was called Digging Trenches. And we had a bunch of little plastic shovels every way. We went into a 21-day a, a time of prayer after that. But there was something that stuck out that, that I, I took from one of those verses and I just put it on the back burner because I'm like, there's something more that I haven't looked into that and investigated, but there's something there. And so and so I started, the, the Spirit of God just started dealing with me and I started putting these pieces together. So this is the verse. You remember the story, the king of Israel went to the king of Judah and said, I'm going to attack the Moabites because they're being jerks. And the king of Eden joined with them and they all marched out in the wilderness. They went all the way around the Dead Sea. In the wilderness, they're dying because they don't have any water. And so they get, the, they get a prophet, and the prophet comes, and he says this in 2 Kings chapter 3. He said, Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of trenches, for thus says the Lord, you shall not see the wind, you will not see the rain, yet this valley shall be filled with water, so that you will drink both you and your cattle and all of your beasts. And so basically what the prophet is saying is, you guys are stuck out here in this dry riverbed in the middle of no man's land, and you're dying. And this is what God's going to do. You're not going to hear the wind. You're not going to see the rain. But miles and miles and miles upstream, God is going to send a deluge. And it's going to create a flash flood. And it's going to come tearing through here like you've never seen before. And if you don't dig the ditches, it's going to flow right past you and keep on going. And then because it's so arid and dry, it's just going to evaporate right into the ground. It's going to be gone. You've got to dig trenches... And if you dig trenches, you'll create reservoirs and you'll have the water you need. And so there's an element of without personal responsibility, they would have missed the blessing that God was sending them. Right? Then there's the story of Moses. And we all understand, you know, who Moses is in Exodus and all that kind of stuff. But the burning bush in, Mo in Exodus chapter 3. Moses said, I must turn aside now to see this marvelous sight, why this bush is not burned up. So Moses is, is a shepherd, and he's got you know his father-in-law's flocks. He's out there in Midian, and, um, and he sees this sight where there's this bush on fire, which isn't in itself weird. could have been like a little lightning strike or whatever. And, and, but the thing's not being consumed, and that gets attention. And so he says, I've got to check this out. And look at verse 4. When the Lord saw... So that tells me that the Lord was looking for something. When the Lord saw that he turned aside and looked, then God called from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. Now I want you to think about this. What would have happened if Moses wasn't curious to investigate things, to take responsibility to say, this seems supernatural, what's going on? Would God have called from the bush? Because God was watching and looking for something. And when Moses turned, that's when God said, hey, Moses. And he said, yeah, I'm here. And then the whole assignment comes to deliver the people of God. And so, again, I get the sense that there's this, this condition of personal responsibility or missing what God had. And then we go to the two on the road to Emmaus. Jesus is risen from the grave. There's two that are going from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they're walking, and they're talking about the events of the day. Wow, we just saw Jesus crucified and buried. It's a horrible, horrible day. And we pick up the story in Luke chapter 24. And as they approached the village where they were going, he, Jesus, acted as though he was going to go farther. So Jesus comes up to these two guys, but they really don't recognize him. And they're walking, and he's explaining the scriptures. He's explaining the law and the prophets and everything in the Bible, how it pointed to Jesus having to be the sacrificial lamb. And then they get to the place where they're staying, the, the Hotel 6, and Jesus acts like he's going to go by. Like, I'll see you later. And they're like, hey, 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 no, 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 it's late. Come on, lodge with us, stay with us. And it's not until dinner time when they break bread that their eyes are open and they say, it's Jesus, and boom, he vanishes. What would have happened if they were like, hey, nice talking to you, but we're over here at Motel 6, we got our room, we don't got one for you, see you later. There's personal responsibility of their hospitality that they would have missed the blessing of seeing and interacting with the resurrected Jesus. And then there's the story of the disciples. And they're out on the lake. Jesus sent them across the lake and he says, you know, you guys go, I'll catch up with you later. And we find it in Mark chapter 6. And it says, seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. And look at this. He intended to pass them by. 
Tell me Jesus doesn't have a sense of humor. They get in the boat. You know, a lot of them are fishermen. And they're crossing the Sea of Galilee, which is like in a great big bowl. So winds can come in there and cause turbulence at any time. Really like flash type stuff. And, and, and all of a sudden the winds are, and they're like, Ugh, you know, this is, this is horrible, you know. And they got all the, the six biggest guys on one side, the six smallest guys on the other side. So they're probably going in circles because they're men. And, you know, they don't know what's going on. And, and Jesus is like, hey, what's up? And, and, and he would have just like passed them by. And they're like, whoa, whoa, Jesus, get in the boat. Get, now, why would he want to get in the boat? He's making better time than they are. Right? But he loves them. He wants to get into our boat. Isn't that awesome? That's a great message all in itself. Jesus wants to get into your boat with you because he loves you. Right? And so, but they would have missed the blessing hadn't they said, wait a minute, don't just pass us by. We want you to be with us. We need you. All of these illustrations have the same flavor to them that there were, uh, there, were, there were intersections with the presence and the power of God that people would have missed if they weren't taking responsibility. If they didn't do something that got the attention of God in their lives. There's an element that, that's in all of these of needing to flag God down. Now, this is so huge because this really is married to, to 2 Chronicles chapter 16, which says this. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose hearts is completely his. Now, God is, is omniscient, right? And he's omnipresent. But, but this, is using, this is using like a euphemism so that we can understand that, that God is, is like he's looking He's looking over a million, he'll go over a million people that aren't taking responsibility to flag him down. And they're missing the blessings of God. They're missing the presence of God. They're missing the interaction with God in their lives because they just don't see it. And the eyes of God are going to and fro over the whole earth looking for someone whose heart is towards him so that he might show himself strong. And that's what it means when it says that he might support them. Other versions say so that he might show himself strong strong on their behalf in their lives. That they be strong in the Lord and the power of the might. What is it that he's looking? He's looking for hearts that are reaching out to him. Hearts that are longing for him. Hearts that are hungry for him. Hearts that are obedient to the word. Hearts that are in the word and learning the word and learning what is theirs in the covenant of the word and saying, hey, wait a minute, God, like your word says I can be victorious. Your word says that I can triumph. Your word says that I can be the head and not the tail. Your word says that I can be above and not beneath. Wait, I, I need you in my life. I'm not going to be able to do this all by myself. Because there are things against me. Now, Jesus knows this, right? He knows that, that the enemy is like a, a, a prowling lion out there trying to devour people. And he wants us to have hearts towards him to flag him down. Now, why is this so important? Because the enemy is out there. And he's real. I've had too many interactions with this kind of craziness. And I want to show you just a couple of things real quick this morning. How he attacks you. How he attacks you. You ready for this? Number one. He accuses you of his own thoughts. Think about this for a minute. Because I know that all of you, I know that, I know that because we're all the same, right? There's nothing new under the sun. We're all the same. Sometimes the enemy tries to isolate us and make us feel like we're special cases of misery. Like there's nobody else that knows me. Oh, believe me, we're all the same. And so I know that things that happen to me happen to you. That's why I hate, you know, clergy that try to set themselves way up here and you're just down here. It's like, no, listen, we're all the same. We're all flesh and blood, right? And, and so, so I know that there's some times where I will just have crazy thoughts coming in my mind. Yeah, you're all like, yeah, we don't really believe that, Pastor Dan. Like, you don't have to prove too much on that. But you know what I'm talking about? You're like, just all of a sudden, zing, a thought comes in. And, and there, there might be a temptation to act on it. All right? Like, there might be, there might be like, you know, so, somebody might be, somebody might be like, like, uh, just like driving you like Pharaoh driving the slaves up a mountain to prove a point and get back to you. 
and, and you know you know that you could probably take a club and beat them to death because they're in front of you, but you don't do that, right? So a thought comes in your mind, and you're like, I should just start beating this guy to death right here now and be done with this, right? But you, you, don't, you don't do that. But there's a temptation to do that because you're in pain. And you're hurting. And they keep driving, 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 driving. Right? And so, so here's the thing. He makes you think that those are your thoughts. And even if you don't act on it, maybe you're driving down the road, right? You're driving down the road, and somebody cuts you off. And you have a thought, hey, you know, you have five fingers on one hand, and there's one of them that sends a signal, and you can just, you know, and, and you, before you even act on that, you get, you know, this thought comes into your mind, and we think it's our thoughts because it came in up here. And it's not necessarily your thoughts. He's zinging this stuff all the time. And here's the thing. If you act on it, he's going to say, what kind of Christian are you? As soon as you do it, right? And if you don't act on it, he's still going to say, what kind of Christian are you to be thinking thoughts like that? So it doesn't even matter whether you act on it. It's just a matter that you had the thought. You thought it was your thought. And immediately he says, oh, I got you. What kind of Christian are you? Who, who are you to go in church and sing, our God reigns, when you think things like this? How dare you, the unmitigated God? I mean, just crazy, right? He wants to convict you of his thoughts. Now look at Paul says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We are destroying speculations. And every lofty thing that raises up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive. To the obedience of Christ. So what does he mean? He means that not all the thoughts are our thoughts. Not all the thoughts are our... You know, listen, we can have God thoughts. Right? God speaks to us in our thought life. When you're creative, God like, gives you creative vision. And, and there isn't anything that you can't imagine that you can't accomplish. Because we're created in the image of a creating God. And, and, and so we can have thoughts that are inspired by God. And then we can have thoughts that are not. And those are the ones that he wants to make you feel like they're yours. And you own them and shame on you. And immediately, all of that, that shame comes in. Why would you think thoughts like that? I had a guy once I was ministering to in jail. And he thought that God never spoke to him. There's people, you'll find like, I never... So, so this guy, it's funny. This guy, th this is the thoughts he was having that God never has spoken to him his whole life. There is no God. He's never... And I'm like, I'm like okay, really? Really? What are, you, what are you in jail for? B and E, breaking an entry. And, oh, okay. I says, listen, when you kicked the front door of that house in, right before you kicked it in, did you have a thought that said, this is probably not a good thing to do. This isn't an ethical thing to do. This isn't a moral thing to do. And he was like, well, yeah, of course. I said, God just spoke to you. Do you think the devil would tell you, don't kick in that door? That's not a good thing to do. He's the one saying, kick it in. He gets some free money, right? So God spoke to him in his thoughts. So here's the thing. God speaks to us in our thoughts. We speak to ourselves in our inner dialogue. The devil speaks. And it's kind of like spaghetti. And we got to really umpire that stuff. That's why the Bible says the peace of God will guard your heart. And literally that word guard means umpire. He's going to call what's fair and what's a strife. All these thoughts that are coming in, let the Spirit of God say, that's out. That's a strike. That, that's no good. That's not you. That's not God. Get rid of it. Don't even dwell on it. Don't even dwell on it. Man, he accuses you of his own thoughts. Secondly, he accuses you to yourself. This is horrible. This is guilt and shame. I'm almost ashamed to say this, but my mom came home one day with this little white dog. It's not a guy dog. Careful. It's, it's not a guy dog. Guys want dogs that eat dogs like this for breakfast. And so we had this little white dog. And my brothers and I, we found out that if we just went, shame, that the dog would slumber, put his head down, and walk away. <laughs> I know, right? Aren't you glad I came to Jesus? So, but there's this communication of shame that makes us deflate and like walk away defeated. Who do you think does that constantly to you? 
shame. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. He's accusing you to you. Who do you think you are? Who you go to church week after week and I saw what you did. I know what you've done here. I've seen it all. And he's always accusing you to you to you. See, there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. God uses conviction when he wants to communicate something to us. And conviction would say something like, you've done bad. Condemnation comes and says, you are bad. It's you. Like there's you. You are bad. How many people are in psych wards because internally they believe they're evil? And sometimes people who believe that start carrying out some of the most heinous crimes ever, ever. You know, you see these things. And they said, well, I just, I just believe that there was something evil in me. Even Dahmer, you know, I think he got saved in prison, um, you know, after eating people, right? I mean, like, like who can do that? Just, you know, cannibalism. Like, you heard about the cannibals that were eating a clown, and they said, does this taste funny to you? <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> oh, come on. Just kidding. Just kidding. So there's, so, there's, so there's conviction that says you've done something bad. There's condemnation that says you are bad, right? And look at what Paul says, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. You see, if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. Now, again, that doesn't give you a license to sin because we're going to sin with a license or without a license, right? That's just the fallen nature. But this, let, this lets us know that when we're in Christ, there is no condemnation. That sentence of judgment, that sort of Damocles that hung over our heads that said, you are a dead man, is gone. It was removed in the cross when Jesus said, it is finished. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so there's no condemnation. Now listen, if the enemy can't keep you out of heaven, he's going to make your journey there as miserable as he can. And he'll paralyze you from doing the good works that will earn you rewards in heaven. You're still going to heaven. But you'll get in on a whimper and a limp without any rewards. Because that's if he can't rip you off from getting there, he's going to rip you off from getting there with anything waiting for you. And so he comes as, as not only the judge, but as the jury, as, the, as the, the, the prosecuting lawyer, and with already a sentence of condemnation. You are bad. You're a bad person. He accuses you of his thoughts. He accuses you to yourself. He accuses you to God. You know, the Bible says that Jesus lives forever to make intercession for the saints. And I was like, I wonder why, I wonder why he does that. Like, I mean, we're saved. But because Satan is always accusing you to him. Like, this is a part of the ministry of Jesus that we don't understand. That, that, that the enemy is before God right now saying, hey, you know that Armelina, uh, Al Molina? Like, like, dude, like, He's like one of your followers? Like, no, 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 no. Look, look, look what he did to you the other day. And Jesus is making intercession, saying he's one of mine. He's under the blood. Right? He's always doing that. Like, like Keith Tilton? Like, my goodness. Like, you know, seriously, right? And Jesus is making intercession for him. And then, and then you know, uh, uh, Bill Whittier? And, and, and the Lord's like, whoo, you might have me on that one. No, come on. No, he's making intercession Right? But there's this accusation right now this morning, probably before the throne of God, he is accusing millions of people constantly. Like, these are your kids? Have you ever, you know, sometimes that's where parents, over, they, they get overboard with discipline and correction because they're afraid of the shame that comes by guilt by association. Our kids are going to do stupid things because they're kids. Right? They do stupid things. But we get all like, well, like, oh, we can't have that happen, you know? And so we either get super on them to, like, control every little thing about their lives because we don't want... My mom, you know, she used to be afraid every time, you know, be careful because people are going to know you're Louise Vossi's kids. She was dead right. She was, like, so right. She was so right, we would get drunk and go down the streets of Portsmouth saying, we're Louise Vossi's kids, screaming it on the rooftops, you know? Killed by, and that's what the enemy does. Like, those are your kids. Like, that's the best you could do. That that sorry lot out there. He's accusing, 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 accusing. 
You know what it's like when you've been accused of something, right? It's, it's, it's as upsetting. Look at, look at Job chapter 1, verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and says, Did Job fear God for nothing? Like, like oh, Job's your big man on the earth today. Wow. But, but he's serving you because you're blessing him. That's all. Take his blessings away. He'll curse you his face. And then it gets ramped up in, in, in chapter 2, verse 5. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he'll curse you to his face, to your face. He's accusing Job before God. He's like, look, look at this guy. And he does that to you too. He's accusing you before God on a regular basis. And God is gracious and in interceding and in saying, they're my kids. They're my kids. They're my kids. Because I love them. Right? And then if that's not bad enough, he accuses God to you. Are you sure God loves you? Because, man, look what you're going through. Seems to me like he's left you. It seems to me like he's kind of like left you. You're struggling big time. Like, like why isn't he helping you right now? You're going through a, a, a fiery furnace. And why isn't he there helping you? Then he begins to accuse God to us. And that's what Job's wife did, right? Remember back in Job chapter 2, verse 9, then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Just curse God and die already. Like, God's not, God is not helping you. God's not on your side. He, you don't have any favor in God. Like, look at all the things that are happening to you. Just get it done with. God's, God's totally trashing you. Just agree with that and be done with it. Wow. That is so, so scary. What, what, what happened in the garden? What, what, did the, what did the enemy do in the garden? Oh, listen, Eve, Adam... God knows that on the day you eat of this, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be like God. And God doesn't want you to be like God, so he's keeping something good from you. And when you look at all the major cults in the world today, they all have this sense of discovering the divinity within you. Because that was the desire that Satan inbred in the minds and hearts of our, of our original parents. You can be like God. God. And there's all this mumbo jumbo cult stuff out there that you can get in touch with the deity was inside of you and you are your own God and you are, and it's all a bunch of baloney. It's all a bunch of baloney accusing God to you. If it's not a bad enough that he accuses you of his thoughts and accuses you to yourself and accuses you to God and accuses God to you, he accuses others to you. Look at that hypocrite can't believe they're back in church today what is wrong with these people oh i don't go to church because it's filled with fakes and phonies where does that stem from the accuser the accuser i saw i saw a, a thing on facebook the other day it, it just it just i had to just stop and take it in for a minute i had to get in touch with my feelings to find out how i felt about it it said if you went to church and got hurt in church it was because you had a relationship with religion and not Jesus. And I was like, hold. Hold the fort right there. Why did you get hurt in church? Maybe you needed to get hurt in church. Maybe somebody was just trying to speak the truth to you in love and you didn't want to receive it because you want to blame rather than moving forward in life. Or maybe somebody was mean-spirited to you because we're a family. And are there any families that are healthy and normal? Are there? Like, dude, all my life I grew up thinking that my family was normal and what was wrong with the rest of the world. Then I got old enough when I looked in the rearview mirror, I'm like, holy smokes. They put the D in dysfunctional. I mean, it was like ridiculous. Right? And so, so listen, this is the whole thing. This is what's happening here. He's accusing others to you. And look what the scripture says in Romans 14.10. Why do you judge your brother? Or again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God. All right, something happens. Get over it. Go to that person. That's what, that's what Matthew 18 says. Go Work it out. Work the rela Relationships are tough. They're not always smooth sailing and, and smiles, right? And so he's accusing all the time. Like, did you see Pastor Ken walk right by you and he didn't even wave? He didn't smile at you today. You shouldn't go back to that church. 
That's how it works. It's always happening. Accusing, accusing. Or Peter, Peter's talking with Jesus. Jesus is talking with Peter. He's resurrected. And he says, Peter, listen, this is how, this is how your life is going to go. And it doesn't end well. And Peter immediately looks at John and he says, what about him? Don't we always do that? We compare ourselves with other people. And Jesus said, what's that to you? You follow me. Get your eyes off other people. We're all running a race set before us. And your race is not his race. And his race is not your race. So you don't worry about him. You just follow me. I might have him on the mountaintop and you think like, oh, why was he special? And you're going through the fiery furnace. But you just wait. I've got, I, I've got this under control. Right? You just wait. That's why I love Paul's statement. Philippians 3, verse 13. Brethren, I do not regard myself as laying hold of it yet. One thing I do. One thing. This is just one thing. Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. This is why I love coaching. Because when people come in for coaching, I don't care what happened that brought them there. I don't want to go in the past. I don't want to get in touch with your feelings when your puppy died and you were five, right? I don't want to get, because I don't care what brought you here to this point. It doesn't matter. Because as soon as we start going in the past, I guarantee you we're looking for something to blame to get ourselves off of being responsible for our choices. What I love about coaching is here you are now. Where do you want to go? And how are we going to do that journey together? That's why I love coaching. Because it just gets people into a forward momentum thing. I would want this for my life. I would rather be this or that or do this. Okay, let's chart that course and start moving to the future. Stop living in the past. There's nothing in the past. It's in the blood. It's, it's, it's water under the bridge. Start moving forward. One thing. I'm not going to look back. What good is looking back? Look, 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 at, look at Lot's wife. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Well, what happened to Lot's wife? She looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. A lot of people don't realize that her, her name, uh, her biblical name was Season. And they take off a little piece of finger and go to their french fries. You're like, what are you doing? I'm just putting a little Season. That's where seasoning comes from. It's biblical. <laughs> So I don't wear suits. I'm sweating up here. Look at, look at Psalms 24, verse 16. For a righteous man falls seven times. Proverbs, I'm sorry, Proverbs. A righteous man falls seven times and arises again. Okay, so the enemy knocked you down. He might win a battle here and there, but he doesn't have to win the war. When I was a kid, I had a bozo punching bag. You remember anyone ever have anyone have a bozo punch? I said, oh, bozo, huh? You know, he had the big red squeaky nose, and you know you'd punch him and he'd go down, and but but his bottom was round and filled with sand, like a lot of supermodels, and and so, and so, pow, he'd go down, and then he'd come back up again, and pow, he'd go, and you know what? You know what? It's like there was a time where he started really ticking me off, and I'd hit him so hard that he'd go down and skid across the floor a little bit. And then come back up again. And finally I was like, ah, oh, who cares? I don't even want to play the stupid thing anymore. When you keep getting back up again, that's exactly what the devil does. He's like, you know, I'm tired of rattling that guy's chain. He's, he's, he's not going to bite. And he'll back up. But you keep getting back up again. You keep getting back up again. You, keep get, you don't quit. Why? Because... Look at these scriptures. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. You know what God's saying? God's saying, get up again. Isaiah 44, 22. I have wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud, and your sins like a heavy mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. You know what he's saying? He's saying, get up again. Micah chapter 7. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever. He delights in unchanging love. He again will have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, he will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. You know what he's saying? He's saying, get up again. Take responsibility. 
And I love that verse, he'll cast them in the depths of the sea. You know why? Because the deeper you go, the darker it gets, and there's no light for exposure. Your sins are blacked out, they're gone. Isaiah 38, verse 17. You've cast all my sins behind your back. You know what he's saying? He's saying, get up again. Psalms 103, 13. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those that fear him. He's saying, get up again. Yes, you're in a battle. Yes, you're in a conflict. Yes, you're wrestling against forces. Yes, there's an enemy that prowls like a roaring lion. Yeah, it's all true. Just keep getting up again. Why? Because God is for you. God is for you. Resist that accuser. When I was a paper boy, I was, you know, I was a kid growing up, and, and I got a paper route, and, um, and, and it was a long route. It was a mile long, and it was in housing developments. And I remember the kid that I was taking over. He was an older kid, and I'm taking the route. And so the first week or so, you know, he's going through the route with me and riding my bicycle, got my little baskets in the back with all of the newspapers in there. And, and he's showing me, you know, this one, you got to put it in the door. This one, just throw it on the doorstep. This one, you got to ring the doorbell, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I'm learning all this. And he goes, okay, now, look at these houses have dogs. And he's like, and this is what you've got to do. They're going to come at you sometimes and their teeth are curved inward. So if they muckle onto your leg, don't pull away because it's only going to tear flesh. Instead, just ram your leg right down their throat because their teeth are curved and if you go further, further in, you're just going to cause them to gag and they're just going to vomit you up. And I was like, okay. And you're like, pastor, did it work? I never let it because as soon as the dog came near me, I was like Lance Armstrong, man. I was like out of there. Like you'll get your paper when I'm doggone good and ready. Like that's when you're going to get your paper. Right? But that's what we got to do when the enemy's like muckling on you. Take the sword of the word of God and jam it down his throat. It is written. It is written. God delights in my forgiveness. God has forgiven me. God has made me righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. God has cast my sins behind him. God has thrown my sins into the depths of the sea. Keep getting up. Be that stupid bozo punching bag. And just keep getting up and keep getting up and keep getting up. We all know, we all know, you know, David and Goliath, this thing in, in 1 Samuel 17. And David spoke to the man who was standing by him saying, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? And that's the attitude that we need to have. We need to say, who is the thief that comes to steal the word of God from me? Who is the thief that's going to come and kill my faith? Who is the thief that's going to come and try to destroy the things that God wants to have for me? And make those declarations and understand that God has caused you to triumph. That God has made you victorious. That God has made you an overcomer. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And here's the thing. If you learn to take responsibility, He will not pass you by. He will show Himself strong in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we are so excited about who you are, your goodness, your love, your compassion towards us. And as we conclude this series on who's holding the sword, Lord, help us to remember that, that we have that sword and that this spiritual warfare really is all about that sword. It's not that we're any kind of threat to the enemy, but we have that truth of the word of God that he cannot stand and he cannot abide in. And it's what makes us strong in you and in the power of your might. And I pray for everyone that's here this morning, those that are going to watch on social media, that, that what would be communicated to them is the overwhelming, unconditional love of our God that is bringing us to heaven regardless. Regardless. But he wants us to enjoy the trip. He wants us to go first class. He doesn't want us to have to crawl into a wheel well and freeze our buns off traveling. He wants us to be first class citizens and be victorious and let the blessings that are ours go out and minister to other people around us. That listen, we are so blessed because of the God that we are in relationship with. And let that light shine in a dark place. And we thank you for your love for each and every one of us this morning, Lord. And we want to walk in it and help us to take personal responsibility for the things of our life 
If they're not going well, let us evaluate what we're doing and how we're doing it. If it's going well, let us be thankful to you, our loving Heavenly Father. But let us be responsible to two words. Resist him. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen and amen. Hey.